of violence, feeling what other people feel. And the study that we published in 2003, basically there were two main predictions that when you imitate facial expressions of this kind, emotions, basic emotions, and when you see them, you activate in both situations uh, the whole system. So this was a kind of a proof of concept. Um, the, the study had a, quite a bit of uh, media coverage and there were some, and, you know, to go back to the theme of politics, there were some titles in, you know, in the media saying, uh, covering our side, I feel your pain, I really do. And this was kind of uh, um, uh, using the, the line of Bill Clinton in one of his uh, uh, campaigns. So this was some, some kind of a proof of concept that this could be a system in the brain that helps us simulate in the emotions of others and feel that people feel. But of course we had no behavioral data that kind of linked in more direct way the activity throughout the system with the tendency to empathize on our subjects. And that's what we have done uh, in the last few years. Um, so we looked at, and we really call this mirror neurons as a biomarker of society and empathy. Uh, a follow-up study of the study that we published in 2003 is done now with kids. We have a longitudinal project of uh, five years in which we recruit kids before they hit puberty. And this is my daughter posing for me. And we uh, use kind of, uh, in the Previous study we used uh, the classical Ekman phases. Now we use uh, a more modern set of uh, uh, facial expression that helps us also looking into gender effects, race effects. We haven't analyzed all this data yet, uh, but we have done some initial studies. And one thing that we found was, in fact, that the whole circuitry that I described previously, areas with mirror neurons, the, in the amygdala, and the insula connecting these two, uh, the activity in this region when our kids watch or imitate facial expression has strong correlations with behavioral measures of empathy and interpersonal competence. This one is a graph that shows the activity in the system um, and the correlation with interpersonal competence. Uh, interpersonal competence, is, it's a scale here that is uh, um, done through a questionnaire with parents in which we, are, we ask the parents how popular is your kid, how many um, play dates he gets, uh, how many friends does he have. And there is a very nice correlation between the activity throughout the system and the social competence of these kids. And we also have correlation with empathy um, in the whole system in which the, the empathic concern of these kids, which is measured again with validated tools, really maps well on activity through the system. So this is a nice, nice evidence that really strongly linked this whole uh, um, neural activity with some behavior in real life. And of course, one of the corollaries of this uh, research, research was the idea that, in fact, if you have a problem in this system, then you may have a problem in social behavior. Because, of course, mirror neurons may actually make social interactions very smooth, very simple, because you can immediately feel what other people are feeling. And a study that we published a couple of years ago shows this. Uh, we have a control group of kids and then a, a group of um, uh, children with uh, autism spectrum disorder. And when they do both imitation and observation of facial emotional expression, these are the active, this is uh, only for imitation. So the, our typically developing kids show activity classically in motor areas and in visual areas. Of course, they are making the facial expression and they are seeing it. But also in this inferior frontal area, that we know contain mirror neurons. Well, actually, we assume because we don't have direct evidence for, from, from these imaging studies. But when it comes to, to, the, to the group of uh, patients with autism, what we get is that there are visual responses and motor responses, but what is lacking are these inferior frontal gyrus activity that uh, we presume is associated with mirror neuron activity. And when you make a, 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 com a contrast between the two groups, what you get is th the only areas that really differ is right here. On top of this, we also find correlation between clinical um, status and brain activity. Uh, there are, these are two uh, largely used scale, the ADOS and the EDI, ADI, that give you an overall sense of the severity of the um, autism in, in the children. And what we find was that the more reduces the activity in mirror neuron areas, the more impaired is the child. So clearly this is another piece of evidence that suggests that there is a strong link between activity in this region and social behavior. And uh, so far I've been talking only of facial expression, imitating them, watching them. Of course, facial expression really are mapped closely to 
emotion. But can we actually see something like that, in a, in a correlation between activity in these areas and uh, a dependency to empathize with others for simpler actions, for actions that are not even emotional? And then I have to go back um, an experiment that we published some years ago that a lot of people call the Tea Party experiment. And here the idea was to test the hypothesis that what mirror neurons really care about are not just the actions, but the intentions associated with those actions. Um, there is some evidence that that's the case, but we wanted to test it more directly. And of course, it's not a simple thing to do because you have to reduce intentions, which are really slippery things, in something that you can uh, make an, some, a, an experiment about. And our idea was simply maybe the context in which the same action occur can give the observer a cue about the intention. So here we have the same grasping action, grasping a, 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 a mag. And uh, we were using both this whole end preemption and this uh, precision grip for both the conditions. But there are two different contexts. In one context, the grasping action is, uh, um, I mean, uh, the grasping action here is embedded in con context in which you see a neatly organized scene. There are cookies, there is a teapot. It suggests somebody's going to have tea. But here you have the same objects, but now what you see are cookie crumbs, uh, an empty cup, a dirty napkin. It kind of suggests that somebody already had tea. So it's the same grasping action, but what follows is something different. In one case, drinking, in the other one, putting the mug in the dishwasher. And what we found was, in fact, that areas with, that we presume contain mirror neurons have differential activity between these two uh, situations with preferential activity for the drinking condition, which is also mapped by single unit data in the monkey that show higher activity, higher, higher number of neurons that code for the eating intention in the monkey experiment. Um, so this study really told us that, in fact, these systems se seem to be more concerned with the uh, intentions of that than the action themselves. And then we thought, OK, let's use this stimuli, the same stimuli we used for this experiment to figure out whether mirror neuron areas really care about the intention of other people. And let's see whether such a simple everyday action, like watching somebody grasping a mug, can correlate, can trigger activity in mirror neuron areas that correlate with the tendency of empathizing of our subjects. And so we used pretty much the same video clips. And what we found, in fact, was that there was a very nice correlation between scores of empathic concern and also cognitive empathy and activity in these areas when our subjects were watching these really simple actions. These are not actions that are even associated with, with emotions. So again, this is another evidence that really uh, creates a nice and strong empirical link between activity in these regions and uh, empathic behavior. So the claim I'm going to make today, well, I have plenty of time. I'm going to finish before my time is due. <laughs> that, in fact, these systems are systems that I call for secular morality. They come all the way back. They don't require massive belief systems to make us good. Um, and it seems that really evolution has shaped out some systems in the primate brain, and presumably not just in the primate brain, to uh, really be pro-social. And now there's plenty of studies really that are popping up. They're really changing the, the classical view, view of the individual as uh, only fighting for self-preservation. And in fact, the, one of my slogans is that evolution made us wired for empathy. That doesn't mean that we can't actually change the, the, our priorities. Not something that is wired doesn't mean innate in this case. It only means that we have the potential, the neurobiological potential to be empathic. And I think that you know one, 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 one of the moves I want to make today is that it's uh, kind of provoking a little bit of discussion, especially in an audience that makes a living out of arguments, is that in contrast with traditionally held ideas that really think that we are good and empathic and social because of our higher intellect, I often think that our beliefs get in, get, get in the way and makes us less empathic. And in fact, there are studies looking at interaction between people and between uh, between individuals and between groups, it really suggests that individuals seem to be fairly trustful of one another when it comes to one-to-one -one interactions. But groups are very distrustful of one another. And if you think about it, you, des you describe groups only in a kind of deliberate, um, explicit way, uh, rather than this kind of implicit, automatic way that mirroring allows you to do. 
But now there's an interesting twist, because now we have made, made this discovery that, in fact, we have something in our brain that makes us built for empathy, and we talk about it. So now what has been for centuries or millennia or uh, uh, more than that, something that is pre-reflected, because these cells are really located in the primordial cortex. They send commands to our uh, muscles, and so they really seem to be pre-reflected kind of uh, neural systems. But now we talk about this, and now we are moving our awareness of these uh, systems in our brain into the uh, deliberate, into the explicit discourse. And I think this is great because, in fact, we can actually try to make this move and to use these discoveries and our understanding of our own empathic nature to actually kind of change some of the aspects of our society that are not as empathic as they should be. I'm done. Thank you.